when I was six years old, I apparently said to my mother that I thought our lives were God's dream. My subsequent education eclipsed that intuition, but it never completely eradicated it. And it surfaced again ten years later in my interest in Vedanta. For the next twenty years I studied and practiced the Vedanta teaching until I met Francis who introduced me to the direct path and also the uh, approach to the body of Kashmir Shaivism which he had learned from Jean Klein. After uh, 14 years with uh, Francis I began to write and speak about these matters. And now, six years later, I find myself in exactly the same position that I started as a six-year-old boy. Feeling that our lives are God's dream, although I would no longer express it in these terms. Rather, I would say that each of our minds are precipitated in, informed by, and made of the same infinite indivisible field of consciousness. Now, when I say each of our minds are precipitated in the same field of consciousness, I give credence to the idea to the belief in a multiplicity and diversity of minds which is itself an extension of the belief in a multiplicity and diversity of bodies. Each of our minds is capable of numerous thoughts and perceptions. But none of those thoughts or percep perceptions ever have an existence of their own, independent of the mind in which they appear. In other words, there is no such thing as a discrete object called a thought or a perception. It is not possible to pluck a thought or a perception out of your mind. In other words, each thought or perception is not, in fact, a discrete object with its own independent existence. It is simply the activity of your own mind. There is no such thing as a thought or a perception. There is just your mind and its own activity. Likewise, there is no such thing as a multiplicity and diversity of separate minds. In fact, there is no such thing as a mind. It is not possible to pluck a mind out of consciousness. The mind does not exist as a discrete object with its own independent existence. Each of our minds is simply the activity 
of consciousness. There is just consciousness and its activity. When we fall asleep at night, our mind dreams a world within itself. But in order to dream the world, our mind must fall asleep. In other words, in the waking state, our mind cannot know the dreamed world. In order to know the dreamed world, in order to manifest the dreamed world within itself, our mind must fall asleep to itself and enter its own imagination, enter its own dream in the form of a separate subject of experience, the dreamed character, from whose point of view it is able to know or perceive the world. Exactly the same thing happens in consciousness. The infinite can only know the infinite. The finite can only be known by the finite. In other words, it is not possible for infinite consciousness to know manifestation, form, the universe, by itself. In order to know a world, infinite consciousness must fall asleep to itself. It must ignore or overlook the reality of its own mind and enter into its own imagination in the form of the separate subject of experience that is each of us, from whose point of view it is able to know itself as the world. In other words, when infinite consciousness falls asleep to itself, it wakes up as the finite mind. And when the finite mind falls asleep to itself, it wakes up as infinite consciousness. This is the meaning of the phrase in the Bhagavad Gita, which is usually translated as what is sleep for the sage is waking for the ignorant. And what is sleep for the ignorant is waking for the sage. The esoteric meaning of this sentence is that consciousness has to fall asleep to itself. It must overlook the knowing of its own being and collapse into the finite mind from whose point of view it is able to know itself as the world. In other words, each of our finite minds are precipitated within the same field of infinite consciousness and each of our minds gives infinite consciousness a window onto itself. Each of our minds enables infinite consciousness to realize a segment of its infinite potential and to know itself as the world. The reason we all seem to know the same world is not because there is one world out there made out of matter. It is because each of our minds are precipitated within, informed by and made of the same consciousness. The sameness of the world we share is the sameness of consciousness.
going back to the analogy of the dream. When the dreamer falls asleep and imagines the dreamed world within her own mind, she has to enter her own imagination as the dreamed character, the separate subject of experience, from whose point of view the dreamed world may be known or perceived. From the point of view of the dreamed character, the separate subject of experience, reality seems to be divided into two separate parts. Matter on the outside, out of which the world, objects and others are made, and mind on the inside, out of which uh, her thoughts, images and feelings are made. That is how reality appears from the perspective of the separate subject of experience. And that is why reality appears to each of us to be comprised of matter on the outside, out of which the world seems to be made, and mind on the inside, out of which our thoughts and feelings seem to be made. But when the dreamer wakes up, she realizes that what seemed to be a duality of mind and matter from the perspective of the separate subject of experience in the dream was, in fact, all her own intimate, indivisible, unlimited mind. It is exactly the same here. When we wake up from the dream of the waking state, we recognize that what seems to be matter on the outside out of which the world is made and mind on the inside out of which our thoughts, images and feelings are made is in fact one all seamless, intimate, indivisible and infinite consciousness. And just as the dreamed character, that is the separate subject of experience within the dream, believes and feels that her experience takes place in time and space. But when the dreamer wakes up, she realizes that what appeared to be time and space from the point of view of the character in the dream, in fact, took up no time or space in her own mind. In exactly the same way, what seems to us, from the point of view of our separate individual minds, to be time and space, the containers in which our experience apparently takes place is in fact dimensionless consciousness. It is dimensionless consciousness refracted through the prism of thought that appears to itself as time. It is dimensionless consciousness refracted through the prism of perception that appears to itself as space. In other words, time and space are what eternal infinite consciousness look like when viewed through the prism of the finite mind or separate self.
as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, a poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a temporary name and form. That's Shakespeare from A Midsummer Night's Dream. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, a poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Would that I had the eloquence and economy of William Shakespeare. <laughs> I need so many words to say what he said with so few. And as infinite consciousness vibrates within itself and assumes the form of the finite mind, it brings existence out of being and gives itself a temporary name and form. Two hundred years later, William Blake, one of the other great tantric masters of the Western tradition, said the same thing in this way. Every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight enclosed by the five senses. Every bird that flies through the sky or indeed any object that appears is the immense and inherently joyful presence of awareness enclosed by sense perception. Perception is as such the agency or the activity through which Infinite Consciousness manifests itself as form. Perception is creation. All we know of the world is mind. Seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. Has anyone here ever experienced a world outside of perception? Therefore, the mind's knowledge of the world can only ever be as good as its knowledge of itself. Scientists have been exploring the ultimate reality of the universe for two and a half thousand years. And they will continue to explore the ultimate reality of the universe for the next two and a half thousand years. Unless they understand 
that in order to know the reality of anything that is known by the mind it is first necessary to know the essential nature of the mind through which it is known to research the ultimate nature of reality without first knowing the essential nature of our own mind is the madness from which our culture is suffering. As the Sufi poet Balayani said, whosoever knows their self knows their Lord. Whosoever knows the essential irreducible nature of their own mind knows the ultimate reality of the universe. This is what Rumi meant when he said knowledge of the world is a kind of ignorance. He didn't mean ignorance in a pejorative sense. Nor is this a life-denying statement. If correctly understood, it understood it is truly a life affirming statement he meant that knowledge of a world made out of dead inert stuff called matter involves the ignoring of reality it is the same understanding to which Raman Mahashi referred when he said the I thought is the mother of the world he didn't mean as is commonly supposed that literally the thought I generates the world infants and animals do not conceptualize I, and yet they experience the world. What Ramana Maharshi meant by the I thought is the finite mind. So correctly understood, he meant the finite mind is the mother of the world the name the finite mind gives itself the name that each of us gives to ourself is I and this is what he meant by the I thought is the mother of the world the finite mind is the activity not the entity there is no such thing as a finite mind there is only consciousness and its activity the finite mind is the activity through which Consciousness knows itself as the world. The same understanding is expressed in the tantric tradition of Kashmir Shaivism by Abhinavagupta when he says, the world is an expansion of I. In order for a world to come into existence, infinite consciousness must collapse into the finite mind. 
It must overlook or ignore itself. It must fall asleep to itself. This falling asleep is called the fall in the Christian tradition. It is called ignorance in Vedanta. The world of objects made out of dead inert stuff called matter only comes into apparent existence when consciousness falls asleep to itself and assumes the form of the finite mind. And that is why within each finite mind, that is within each of us, there is a wound. A feeling that we have been cut off from our essential identity, a, a feeling that we have left our home. Most people seek to alleviate the pain of this wound through the acquisition of objects, substances, activities, states of mind and relationships. And none of us would be here today if that search for peace and happiness in objective experience had worked. In fact, we are all here precisely because it hasn't worked. What the finite mind or the separate self is really seeking is not an object, a substance, an activity, a state of mind or a relationship, however fine or noble these may be. It is simply seeking to be divested of its limitations to be returned to its source. In fact, not even to be returned there, for it never left there. The character in the dream never leaves the dreamer's mind. The character in the dream is simply a limitation of the dreamer's mind. But the knowing with which the character in the dream knows her experience does not live inside her body, nor can it be found in her world. It is the knowing that is the nature of the dreamer's mind. This is why it is said that to realize our true nature no new knowledge comes to us. The recognition of our true nature is a revelation. Reve the word revelation coming from the word revelare in Latin meaning to lay bare. The recognition of our, of the irreducible nature of our own minds involves simply a laying bare of its essence. That's what Ramana Maharshi meant when he said, when the I is divested of the I, only I remains. When the finite mind is divested of everything that seems to make it temporary or finite, its reality, infinite consciousness, is laid bare or revealed to itself. Thus the highest endeavor upon which any mind can embark is the investigation into its own essential irreducible nature. The essential irreducible nature of the mind is that element of the mind that cannot be removed from it, that element of the mind that remains continuously present throughout all experience. 
What is that? Only the knowing with which all experience is known. You may be interested in this talk or you may be bored by it. But in both cases your experience is known. You may be deeply depressed or newly in love. In both cases, your experience is known. Knowing is the common element in all experience. The only element of experience that never changes or disappears. And is, it is as such said to be the background of experience. But this is only a partial understanding. To say that the essential irreducible nature of the mind is knowing or that knowing is the continuous element of mind is to suggest that there is something other to mind than knowing. It is to suggest that knowing is just one element of the mind. Ask yourself now, is there any substance present in my experience other than the knowing of it? Have any of you ever come in contact with anything other than the knowing of experience? In fact, not even the knowing of experience, as if experience were one thing, and the knowing of it another. All there is to experience is knowing. your attention to go wherever it likes in your current experience, your remembered experience, your imagined experience. Is anything other than knowing ever known? Matter, out of which the world is supposedly made, is the substance that exists outside of or independent of knowing or consciousness. No one has ever or could ever come in contact with that substance. belief in the existence of a substance called matter that exists outside of and independent of consciousness is simply a religion. 
the religion of materialism from which our culture is suffering. The inevitable consequences of this religion are suffering on the inside and conflict on the outside. Not only have scientists been looking for this stuff for two and a half thousand years, but politicians have also been trying to bring peace and fulfillment to the communities and nations that they were elected to govern. They have still not managed to do so. And they will never manage to do so until they find the source of peace and fulfillment within themselves. in order to find the source of peace and fulfillment within themselves, it is necessary to investigate the nature of their own mind. No amount of discussing or arguing about policies will make any difference to the level of peace and fulfillment in society on a long term. Has anyone here not ever had an argument with a loved one or an intimate companion? And notice that the argument eclipsed, at least to a degree, and for a certain length of time, the love that you shared. We've all been there. All the argument consists of is a series of thoughts. It is this series of thoughts that eclipses the love that the two people share. In other words, it eclipses the experience of their shared being. Love is the experience of our shared being. The consciousness that is the shared element of each of our finite minds. When our shared being is eclipsed by our thoughts, the argument in this case, <coughs> love seems to be veiled and even at times turns 
into hatred. But hatred is not the absence of love, it is simply the veiling of love. The reason I'm saying this is because I am aware that we are approaching a critical time in American history. Do you realize the implication of what I'm saying? In between are two thoughts. In between two thoughts. What is there that separates us from someone else? In between two thoughts, we stand as one with the other. We stand in love with the other. It is only when our shared being is eclipsed by the content of our thoughts that it seems to be missing, that love seems to be missing and conflict and at times even hatred ensues. What I am trying to imply is that Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are in love with each other, but they don't know. <laughs> but they don't yet know it. That, that was not supposed to be a joke. <laughs> I mean it literally. Can you imagine at a presidential debate, the retreat I've just finished on the East Coast, the first night of the retreat took place on the evening of the second debate. And I was under strict orders from the attendees to make sure that my opening meditation was finished by five to nine. <laughs> so we all adjourned and watched the debate. And it occurred to me that all that separated Trump and Clinton, all that made them feel separate from one another, all that made them feel hatred for one another, were the thoughts in their mind. Where was that hatred in between two thoughts? It was non-existent. In between two thoughts, they stood as one in love. Can you imagine the impact that it would have had if one of them, just for a moment, had noticed that in between two thoughts, there was nothing to separate them one from the other. Can you imagine the impact if one of them not just noticed that, but felt the implication of that recognition, felt at that moment that he or she stood one with the other? And can you imagine if one of them had had the courage and the humility to feel that and to allow that feeling understanding to guide and dictate the subsequent conversation? when one shakes hands at the beginning and end of a debate 
in that moment one is afforded the possibility of feeling and expressing your shared being. This symbol, this beautiful symbol of shaking hands is a moment between two thoughts where the two opponents stand as one in love. That is all it takes. So, when I look back on the intuition I had as a six-year-old boy, and I look at the feeling, understanding that I have now, and the 50 years that intervened. I wonder, was it necessary to make the journey? what we call the beginning is often the end and to make an end is to make a beginning the end is where we start from T.S. Eliot why was the great adventure necessary I asked myself was it necessary yes it was As the six-year-old boy, the self that I believed myself to be and the God whose dream I felt that I was living were at an infinite distance from one another. The great adventure was necessary to close that distance. the great adventure was necessary in order to understand what Rumi meant when he said I searched for myself and found only God I searched for God and found only myself (laughs) 